Hi, I'm Pastor Dave, teaching evangelists with Lamb and Lion Ministries. You know, very soon on the Christ and Prophecy TV show, we're starting a series in the book of Daniel. To supplement this upcoming series, I want to highlight some critical nuggets. Now, last week, I dove deep into chapter 7. This week, I want to take a deep dive into chapter 8. Chapters 8 to 12 describe God's people during the times of the Gentile. Now, this chapter focuses on events which took place during the second and third earthly kingdoms from Daniel's past visions. Okay, critics of the book of Daniel use this chapter to proclaim that the book of Daniel was not written by him, that it had to be written in the second century BC. So why in the world do they say that? Because the prophecies of Daniel's prophetic vision in chapter 8, they're described in such detail they believe they could not have come from him. You know, however, the Jewish priest who led the Maccabean revolt in the second century against the Syrian Empire, he pressured his son to remain faithful, citing the three Jewish men in the blazing fire and citing Daniel in the lion's den. He said these are faithful examples that his son should follow. This means the events in the book of Daniel, such as the fiery furnace and the lion's den, they were widely known in the second century BC, which means the book of Daniel could not have been written in that time frame as critics want to suggest. All right, once again, this chapter is built around a vision which Daniel receives, and it's found in verses 1 to 14. Once again, Daniel is in need of a divine interpretation. This is given in verses 15 to 26. The events of this chapter take place in the third year of the Persian king's reign, which we know is 551 B.C., this means two years have passed since chapter 7. In this vision, Daniel found himself in Sushan on, on a riverbed near the king's palace. This was a vision Daniel was not physically transported to the, the city. Susa, which this Greek's name was, this was 230 miles south of Babylon and 120 miles north of the Persian Gulf. It, it was a capital city. At the time of Daniel's vision, the palace at Susan had not been built yet. The construction was done by Darius, who reigned almost 30 years later, from 522 to 486. Now this is 551, meaning Daniel had to be carried away by the Spirit to the city of the future. Standing by the canal would have given Daniel a panoramic view of the city. He looks up, and in verse 3, he, he says he saw a ram by the canal. Verse 20 identifies the ram as a symbol of the Medo-Persian Empire. According to the Persian holy book, the Persian guarding a spirit is the form of a man with pointed horns. Also, the nations of the ancient east were represented by the zodiac signs. The sign for Persia is Arius, the ram. Verse 20 reveals the ram had two horns. One horn represents the Medes, the other the Persians. The horns were not equal in length. One was higher than the other, meaning one nation was larger and stronger than the other. Now, we know the Persians were the more powerful half. Daniel says one horn came up last, which also was true. The Medes were a major power before the Persians. In fact, they were a nation an entire century before Persia. History confirms that in 612, the Medes helped the Babylonians conquer the Assyrians. The ram is like the, the chest and arms of Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2 and the lopsided bear in Daniel's vision in chapter 7. In verse 4, Daniel says he saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward. Now remember, this is all the future things that are being revealed to him. These events had not taken place yet. For you and me, history tells us the Medo-Persian Empire did expand westward by conquering Babylon, Syria, and Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. They also expanded northward, all the way to the Caspian Sea, where they conquered what is now modern-day Ukraine and Russia. Then they expanded southward, overthrowing Egypt and Ethiopia, just as Scripture said. And they did not make any significant conquest east. Verse 4 also prophetically says, no beast could withstand this ram. Again, history reveals no nations could withstand their attacks. According to Daniel chapter 2 and 7, we know God allows each Gentile empire a certain amount of time before terminating its domination and transferring the power to one another. 
In 551, the time of this vision, the Babylonian Empire was still the power. They're still the world power. And in verse 5 to 14, Daniel saw a male goat coming from the west. For three reasons, we know the goat is the Greek Empire. Well, first of all, verse 21 reveals that the king of Greece is Alexander the Great. Second, when he came to conquer Persia, he came from Macedonia and Greece, which both are west of Persia. Remember, Daniel saw the goat coming from the west. Third, the nations of the ancient east were all represented by the zodiac signs, and the sign for Greece is Capricorn, the one-horned goat. And the national emblem for Macedonia was a goat. Daniel was told the goat touched not the ground, which was true. Alexander's army moved extremely fast. His military campaigns extended further than both the Babylonians and the Persian empires. The horn was very visible because it protruded high into the air. This horn was the king, Alexander the Great. Alexander's father, King Philip II, transformed Macedonia from a small kingdom into the most formidable fighting force in the region. Now, he was killed when Alexander was just 20 years old. So Alexander continued with his father's army, crushing all opposition. Alexander is also well known for his understanding of philosophy, which he learned from his tutor, tutor, Aristotle. He had a desire to spread the Greek philosophy, Greek culture, and, and the Greek language around the globe, which in fact he did. This is why Greek is the original language of the New Testament. Thanks, Alexander. Verses 6 and 7 describe the destruction of the Medes-Persian Empire. Daniel foresaw the goat, Alexander, coming against the ram, Persia. A hundred years before Alexander's campaign, this, this was a personal campaign because Darius the Great and his son Xerxes tried to invade Greece, not once, but twice. This happened in 490 and 480 BC. Both times, Persia failed to conquer Greece, but the Greeks... They never forgave them for even trying. In retaliation, Alexander took a small army of 35,000 as he conquered the ram, Persia. The assault happened in May of 334. And by winning this battle, Alexander freed all the Greek cities from Persian control. In the second battle, which took place in November of 333, in this battle, he took Phoenicia, modern-day Lebanon, Egypt, and Israel. He took that from Persia. The third and last battle, which took place in October 331, gave him control of all the land from the Tigris River to Nineveh, which basically ended the Persian Empire. Alexander then conquered Susa, the capital of the Medes Persian Empire, and he looted and burned down the palace. Verse 8 explains what happened to the Hellenistic or Greek Empire. After Alexander's death in June of 323, and after 20 years of civil war, the empire was split up by four of his generals. Verse 9 prophesies the rise to power of Antiochus Epiphanes, the king of Syria, who ruled from 175 to 164. He was known as the madman. In Daniel's vision, he's seen as the little horn, which is distinguished from the little horn in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel is shown the, the future path of victory for this ruler. He will first attack Egypt and then Jerusalem. He severely persecuted Jews in both Judah and Samaria. His evil ways were what led the Maccabee revolt against him. Verse 11 and 12 prophetically describes a specific action that Antiochus uh, committed. This is the foreshadow of the Antichrist's abomination of desolation. Epiphanes took the self-claimed title of deity. Epiphanes means God manifest. His goal was to stop Jewish temple worship and to cast down or desecrate the Jewish temple. He emptied, he emptied the temple of its furnishings and commanded the Jewish people to violate the law of Moses. How? By profaning the Sabbath and festivals and by setting up altars to pagan gods. He built altar idols throughout Judah and he burned incense in the street. He polluted the temple in Jerusalem and called it the temple of Zeus and he filled it with debauchery. He built a statue of Zeus and commanded the Jews to sacrifice and worship to this god. In 167, he offered a pig to the pagan god Zeus on the altar and desecrated the holy temple. In verse 13 and 14, two angels appear. One asks a question and one provides an answer. Verse 13 is the question. How long would what Daniel saw in this last vision last? How long would this happen? How long would the little horn, Antiochus, be allowed to stop true worship? 
The angel mentions the, the transgression, which is placing the image of Zeus in the Jewish temple. The angel also mentions the sanctuary and hosts, which is saying the abomination would take place in the holy temple, and the host is the Jewish people, that they would be persecuted. Verse 14 provides the answer to how long. He says it would be 2,300 evenings. The persecution of the Jews in the Holy Land began in 175, when the high priest was replaced. Antiochus replaced him with his evil brother Jason. Jason was then replaced by a more evil brother who actually bribed Antiochus for the position of high priest. That brother then assassinated his other brother, the legitimate original high priest. <laughs> what a family! The abomination of desolation was placing the statue of Zeus, which had Antiochus' face on it, into the Jewish temple. To enforce his laws and to ensure the Jewish people engaged in idol worship, Antiochus sent his soldiers to the village throughout Judah. Judah. When they reached the small village just 12 miles northwest of Jerusalem, the soldiers demanded the local leader, which was a Jewish priest, they, they, they demanded he be an example and sacrifice a pig on the pagan altar. Well, the priest refused and said he would kill any Jew who even attempted to do so. He then killed the king's representatives, and he tore down the pagan altar. Antiochus responded by attacking the Jewish people in that village, killing men, women, children, and even animals. It was recorded that a thousand people died that day. This is what triggered the Jewish revolt of 167. The priest's family, known as the Maccabees, which means the hammer, kept fighting. It took three years, but they were victorious. In 165, the temple was cleansed. The Maccabees not only cleansed the temple in Jerusalem, they demolished the old altar. They, they built a new altar, and they made new holy vessels including a lampstand, an altar of incense, a table of showbread, and curtains. Then they rededicated the temple. You see, when King Solomon dedicated the first temple, he decided that they should follow the Feast of Tabernacles. We find this in Leviticus, Numbers, and Second Chronicles. So the dedication of the first temple was observed with, with eight days of, of the lighting of the lampstands. The Maccabees decided to follow the example, and this is why Hanukkah is celebrated for eight days. Daniel had a, a deep desire to understand the meaning of this vision. In verses 15 to 18, a, a man who had the appearance or likeness of a man appears. The language reveals this was not a man, but it was an, an angel. A message is given to the angel, but by who? See, did Daniel hear the voice of God, or did Daniel hear the voice of the archangel Michael? Michael and Gabriel are connected later in Daniel, uh, in both chapters 10 and chapters 12. The archangel Michael does have the authority to give orders, orders to other angels. And by the way, this is the first time in Scripture the name of a good angel appears. The first appearance of an angel's name in the New Testament happens in Luke chapter 1. But back to this. In verse 17 and 19, it describes the effect this encounter had on Daniel. The angel, Gabriel, scared Daniel to the point that he fell to the ground. The angel informed Daniel that the vision he saw belongs to the time of the end. This refers to the days of the Antichrist. Daniel's vision extended far beyond the time of Antiochus. It goes to the end times. Verse 18 explains the effect of, of Gabriel's words on Daniel. Daniel fell into a deep sleep, kind of like Abraham, what Abraham experienced in, in Genesis 15. As Daniel laid on the ground, the angel touched him and, and had him stand up. Now, from Daniel's perspective, the time of Antiochus was still future and could be what Gabriel was referring to. However, Gabriel went beyond Antiochus to the time of the Antichrist. The Antichrist had already been induced in chapter 7. Gabriel specifically stated, the later time of wrath, meaning the tribulation, and the final king of the time of the Gentiles, will be the Antichrist. This is being made very clear to Daniel. What Antiochus did in history, the Antichrist will do in the future. Now, verses 20 to 22 gives us the interpretation of the ram and the interpretation of the goat. It's common with prophecy to have a meaning for the original audience and to a future audience. This means there are two types of future. The immediate future, which in this case would be the Medes and the Persians, and Alexander the Great, and the second future, which is the Antichrist 
and the yet still to come tribulation period. Verse 22 switches from plural to singular. That language points us out that Gabriel was not referring to the four Greek kingdoms, but the angel is making a point, a specific point to Daniel, that he's dealing with a more immediate future, that he was going to be dealing with something that was far distant. In, in verses 23 to 26, Gabriel gave a prophetic description of the Antichrist. And there he points out four things that we can see about him. Gabriel concludes this interpretation by instructing Daniel what to do with this vision. He is to seal it up. Then he explains the reason for sealing it up. You see, this vision belongs to the days to come. Now, after recovering from this encounter, which caused Daniel to be ill for several days, he went back to work. But he was still not able to completely comprehend this vision. The vision was not for Daniel, but for a future generation. Now, here's where the exciting part comes in. I, I believe we are, we could be, I believe we are, this future generation that the angel was showing Daniel. This is where this book gets really excited. And as we continue forward, we'll see more and more of this as it's coming into play. But between now and then, all we can do is look up and say, Maranatha, Lord Jesus. Uh -huh.